Hi, I'm Dean McKenzie, Acting Director of OSHA's Director of Construction. We're here today to talk about the ANSI TIA 1019A standard. This is the most specific construction standard for the telecommunication tower industry. In the hierarchy of regulatory controls, we would start out with the federal OSHA standards, have the state standards that can be more restrictive, then we'll get down into the industry consensus standards. This is one developed by the communications tower industry. It is very specific to telecom towers. I'd like to ask Mark Lauterbaugh to talk a little bit about how important this standard is to the tower owners. Thanks, Dean. Uh, again, it is very, very important to the tower owners. You know, we, we expect the work to be done safely and efficiently, and by following those, those rules and regulations, we can be assured that in all likelihood, if the contractor is aware of them and they're following them, that the work is going to be done that, in that fashion and that we're not going to have problems, we're not going to endanger lives or damage the tower. It's really important to you then, Mark, that when you're choosing a contractor, that that contractor truly understands that, that from a contractual, but, but even more importantly from a, a relationship aspect, you expect them to be aware of these standards and whether or not they have competency in these standards. Absolutely. We're relying on them. We're hiring you as being the expert and knowing them and following them. You know, that's an interesting point because when we come into this, we've got the ANSI TIA 1019A, and that's what you kicked us off to talk about, Dean. But Mr. James Rutlinger here is going to talk instead about 222 because I think before we get into that dialogue of what 1019 accomplishes for us, it's important for us to understand the engineer record and how they look at the structure as it stands today and how we get to that modified state of that structure. If you will, there's an A today, C is the modified state, and for the longest time in our industry, it was just assumed that it would go from A to C without that middle step. James, can you help us understand that from the 222 perspective? Absolutely. The, the 222 standard is specific for the design and analysis requirements for that completed structure. So it, it's, again, in that, that A condition is the existing condition of the tower, possibly with changes in the equipment, changes in the service. Now, the engineer record at that point is looking at that tower in a static state with the changes in, employed with the equipment or, or any other type of changes that are being sought after, and they're analyzing that tower in accordance with the 222 standard for its serviceable lifespan. Now, we also, also get into the point C that we're going to be talking about a little bit more today, which is really the modif modification design. Again, the modification design, whether they're doing upgrades or basic maintenance, has to be done in accordance with the 222 standard. And the engineer that takes that responsibility is known as the engineer of record. But again, they're specifically looking at that tower in its completed state. Well, that's where 1019 really becomes important because it has multiple intended audiences, but there's two principal audiences that were intended in 1019. Can you elaborate a little bit on those two principal audiences for us, James? Absolutely. When we look at, at the contents of the 1019, it's, it's a standard specific, again, it's a consensus industry standard specific to tower construction and what those requirements are. You can think of it as a refinement to the ASCE 37 standard for general construction. Now, the requirements of, of the 1019 and the scope of what it covers is both the planning that needs to be con completed before we undertake any type of these construction projects. It also covers the, the imposed construction loading, how that's applied to the tower, and the strength requirements for that tower under construction, in addition to some an analysis and uh, specialized design requirements for very specific tower industry equipment, such as gen poles and base-mounted hoists, and also some of the temporary bracing that, that we get into. But as far as how that bridge is, is connected in between the two, and we already discussed the engineer of record, and that they're responsible for looking at that structure in its completed state, now, within the 1019A, the engineer that's involved with that construction plan is really known as the qualified engineer. And that individual not only has to be very well-versed within the 222 standard, but they also have to specialize and be well-versed within the 1019A standard so that they can not only read and understand the rigging plan that's been submitted by the contractor, but they can also communicate back what those requirements are. So the 1019 is really speaking to those two primary audiences, the contractor and the engineer, but it also talks to the regulator and the owner. So when you engage our services as a contractor and we're going to modify a structure, 
you're looking for us to be able to modify that structure in a quality manner through proper planning, right? Absolutely. The next thing is, is you're always concerned with, it's, it's not just first, it's an always concern with the safety of the individuals that are going to do that work and rely on that structure. Absolutely. We, we want to make sure that no one, no one is injured or, or exposed to serious injury, not during the construction or after the construction. So while well, you as an owner are conveying that to us and setting that clear expectation, that's the only reason you exist, isn't it? Pretty much. Uh, OSHA exists for the safe and healthful workplaces of every employee in the country. It's a, every employer's responsibility to provide a safe and healthful workplace for their employees. Consensus standards like 1019A give OSHA the roadmap and direction of what those employers are supposed to be doing to safely perform the work they have to do on a tower and how they're going to protect their employees and the number of people involved in as James mentioned, there's at least two engineers. Are there other engineers that might be required for rigging? And Yeah, there are other engineers that may be involved, and, and we may have to engage for the rigging practices, and that's really something where me as the contractor needs to start to evaluate that. So if you take a look at Mark decides to award me a project. Now I bid that project. As part of bidding that project, I have to have in mind the standards that apply, the qualifications of my people for that scope of work, and how I'm going to communicate with everybody involved in the scenario. James mentioned a moment ago that 1019A spells out things for the contractors. One of them is the different classes of rigging plans. What we talked about is maybe we'll just focus in on the class 4 rigging plan because that really touches on a qualified person and a qualified engineer. So if we have one where we're going to change the bracing out on a self-supporting tower. Actually, John Erickson helped us with one of these not that long ago, didn't he? We had 800% overstresses in the legs of the self-supporter in the process of changing out bracing, didn't we? That's, that's correct. And the initial rigging plan that was submitted, not only did it contain the construction drawings that were required for that site, but it also contained the, the actual plan that had been developed, the initial plan that was developed by the contractor, which was simply to go in and replace the members one at a time with no temporary bracing. And that, that was the initial plan that, that was submitted into the engineer. Now, acting as a qualified engineer, the first thing that I'm looking at is I, I want to see how long are those members going to be remain out of the bracing system so I can take into account that duration. I'm also looking at any other type of construction loads that are going to be imposed on the, to the tower while it's in that state and perform that construction analysis of the tower in the construction phase. Now, what we found with that structure is with the members removed, the tower legs would have been overstressed 800 percent, which, which obviously is unacceptable. So immediately pass that back to the contractor and, and let the contractor know temporary bracing is absolutely going to be required for this site to complete this project. So now I guess that, that leads me down a road of, well, if you're going to come back and tell me what my rigging plan has to do, why don't you just create the rigging plan for me as a qualified engineer instead of me doing it as the contractor? Yeah, and and we, we, we've joked about this in the past, and, and it's, the, it's the same reason that we don't want the contractor designing the modifications. That these are, these are two very special functions. The qualified engineer and the engineer serving this, this function is not specifying the means and methods. They are not telling the contractor exactly what type of rigging system has to be employed, and they're not taking ownership of that rigging plan. They're simply reviewing the rigging plan and they're certifying the structure has the stability and strength to support the, the construction application that's, that's going to be completed on site, but absolutely not taking over ownership on the plan itself. They, the plan goes back to Scott at this, at this point and with the note, at this point you absolutely have to employ temporary bracing for us to proceed. It sounds like two guys working together to solve a problem with each with their own specific expertise and ability to bring to the middle and the standard requires that. Yeah. And so I'm hearing as well that there's constant communication. So when something changes, the, the engineer and the contractor have to communicate that change and make uh, adaption uh, to those uh, changing conditions. Great opportunity for us to apply the sauce, the stop, assess, understand and communicate and then execute that we've talked about in some of the other videos in the series. So let's delve a little bit deeper. Duration, means and methods, 
what I'm going to use for a process. These are all things as a contractor I have the expertise in. And it's my obligation to be able to find a way to communicate that effectively to my qualified engineer on a class four plan. I may decide to use a gin pull for this modification. I may decide to rig the tower using the tower leg. I may decide to bring in a boom truck. I need to convey this stuff. And that's, that's really a big part of why when you make a suggestion to me on my rigging plan, you're giving me the counsel as my qualified engineer, but you're working for me. And it's my responsibility to ensure that I implement that plan properly as we move forward in the modification of that structure. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and again, kind of the back and forth that we talk about, the development of these class four plans, especially when we're talking about potential need for temporary bracing or shoring, this, it's very common that this is an iterative process and the communications are absolutely critical. And again, that's, that's one of the benefits to having individuals that are very well versed within that 1019A standard. It gives us the common vernacular that we can efficiently communicate. We can pull the critical information from one another that we need to know to complete, to, to complete our jobs. So when that comes back, I, I tell Scott, you absolutely have to employ temporary bracing. Scott might come back and provide me the temporary bracing that he has available. Maybe he used it on a previous project and gives it, gives it back to me. I, I conduct the analysis based upon the, the span that he's proposed to leave the bracing out of the system. And I might come back to Scott and say, I, I'm sorry, but this bracing is undersized. And so the, the process goes back and forth. The end result, result from these rigging plans is always assurance that we've got the strength and stability in the, in the structure to support the, the actual rigging applications and the construction activities on site. Yeah, it's intriguing when you talk about it because even if we have a change in sequence, that type of stuff that's all outlined in the rigging plan, and that really helps us with what the standard was meant to do. We talked about how under 222, we look at that structure as it is today, determine whether or not we need to make modifications to that structure and what it'll stand as once modified. And prior to 1019A doing what it did, it, it really was difficult for us to have that common language or vernacular that you referenced to be able to communicate with all parties. You know, primarily who we're talking about communicating with is the contractor and the engineer. However, this standard has created a real impetus for the industry to work together to where regulators can use it. Owners can rely on it because you're gonna have a quality and safe install, and that's gonna give network reliability. It's gonna give comfort to everybody because we know we're planning and communicating. But there's a final party we have to be aware of. Once you've told me I'm okay with my rigging plan, and I'm comfortable implementing my rigging plan, I really do have the obligation to communicate that to everyone that's gonna perform work on that site, don't Absolutely. I? Absolutely. That's that training and education piece you, get, you folks are so concerned with. That's correct. So, in closing, I'd like to thank everybody here, as well as everybody in the industry that's been a part of it. Think about what's happening in our industry. These consensus standards that Dean talked about earlier, our industry changes so rapidly and they really are the most effective means for us to perform this work in a quality, safe, and efficient manner. I'd like to thank TIA, NATE, NWSA, TIRAP, PCIA for the efforts they have to communicate to the industry as a whole what's occurring. And I'd like to thank everybody for their time that took the time to watch this video. In the closing credits, we've included a few websites we hope everyone will find beneficial. Have a great day.